Tom Knoll. Our speaker today is Tom Knoll, the Director of Quantum Computing at Colquana. Tom currently leads Colquana's effort to build a cold atom quantum computing system and is principal investigator on a cold quanta led collaboration of industrial, academic, and national lab partners under the DARPA ONIS program to demonstrate quantum advantage on real world applications. He comes to cold quanta following a PhD in trapped ion quantum information from the University of Washington and a stint at Ball Aerospace helping the Air Force make holes in things with lasers. All right. Thanks for the introduction, Matt. And uh, thanks everybody for joining. So today I'll be talking about uh, quantum computing and the role of entanglement, uh, dwelling on some of, uh, dwelling some on why uh, entanglement gives rise to strange and non-classical phenomena, phenomena that are artistically rendered here in a painting by my thesis advisor, uh, Boris Flinov. Thanks, Boris. Uh, then I will switch gears and I'll uh, discuss the cold atom approach to quantum computing briefly, um, paying the closest attention to one particular Rydberg blockade-based implementation of an entangling gate protocol. Um, and then follow that with a general discussion of errors that arise in uh, gate implementations based on Rydberg interactions and a surface view of, of how to avoid or, or mitigate those errors uh, through, through system engineering and system design. So quantum computing, what, uh, what is it? Uh, quantum computing is computing where the information is encoded in physical objects uh, that manifestly obey the laws of quantum physics. So whereas in classical computing, we encode information in the classical bit, the two state object that obeys uh, deterministic classical physical law, uh, zero one on off. Um, in quantum computing, we employ a quantum bit or qubit uh, where this uh, element is still a two state object, uh, but now is obeying uh, quantum physics. And one of the upshots of the qubit obeying quantum mechanics is that its state is now described by a pair of amplitudes. And this is commonly visualized as a, as a vector on a unit sphere um, shown in the lower right, where the, the pure uh, zero qubit state resides at the North Pole and the pure one state resides at the South Pole. And between those, uh, those extremes, there's a continuous range of, of superposition states. So what what uh, what is this kind of expansion of the uh, of the capability of the information encoding unit um, do for us? Uh, it enables a, a whole slew of of new quantum algorithms that have the potential for polynomial and super polynomial speed ups of uh, uh, compared to classical approaches in uh, across a wide variety of of application areas um, and use cases. Um, some of those uh, some of those application spaces you know, range from uh, the well-known Shor's factoring algorithm uh, to unstructured search, quantum chemistry, uh, finding uh, chemistry chemical ground states, uh, quantum simulation. And one of the the uh, application spaces that uh, may find the um, quantum advantage in the relatively near term, is uh, the space of combinatorial optimization, which, which finds kind of sub-applications in, in, in a variety of fields. And, and I think a, a really exciting prospect, given the, the nascent nature of, of the field of quantum computing is that there will almost certainly be many more uh, as yet undiscovered algorithms, applications, and use cases uh, that'll be uncovered as we uh, achieve a tighter feedback loop between algorithm development and deployment on systems of meaningful size um, and capability as, as those start to emerge. I, I don't imagine that uh, when the Enigma machine was invented that they were anticipating uh, cat GIFs, but um, it'll be very exciting to see what the quantum cat GIF is. So why, uh, 
why then? And what 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 is it about quantum mechanics that makes uh, that gives quantum computers, at least in some cases, uh, this this kind of advantage, this power over over classical approaches? And um, before waving my hands at um, a couple of possible answers to that question, I'll admit that this this really remains an open topic of research without kind of fully definite answers. But a common uh, answer is to to look to uh, superposition. Superposition, as I alluded to before, is the name that we give to the capacity of uh, quantum states to be spread out over multiple uh, computational basis states. And it's this feature that makes um, Hilbert space uh, such a big place, uh, to paraphrase the, the oft-quoted Carlton Caves, where the, uh, the actual statement from the, the paper cited in the lower left is, uh, Hilbert space is gratuitously big, which, uh, which I think is even more evocative, but um, I, I guess it lacks the rhyme. Uh, so so in, a, in a classical computer, the, the state of n classical bits is, of course, fully described by um, n bits. Uh, three bit state needs needs to be described by by three bits, um, three zeros and ones. But the full description of a of a state of n qubits requires um, a, a much larger state space to be described. It, it requires two to the n amplitudes. So a, a three qubit state, um, as shown on the right, uh, needs to be described by eight amplitudes. And uh, so this this leads to of this hand-waving basis for the exponential power of quantum computing. An n-qubit quantum computer has a state space of size two to the n, it's, it's enormous. Um, but the, the benefit of this enormous state space is indirect because when we measure a quantum system, it collapses to just one of those two to the n states uh, each time we measure in, in a probabilistic way. And so we, we, uh, we only get n bits of information out kind of each time we, we prepare and measure such a state. So it sounds like you know maybe that's not quite enough. Uh, so the the this is typically coupled then with a, with a second feature of of quantum computing, which is which is called entanglement, um, and that's one of the focuses of of uh, the talk today. Uh, entanglement is is a, a phenomenon where uh, multi-body quantum states can be can be non-separable. There's there's a, extremely strong correlations between the states of, of uh, distinct uh, quantum objects. Um, and this leads to this apparent non-locality that, uh, that Einstein famously uh, objected to, where these correlations persist even when the constituents are, are spatially distant. And uh, so what I have up on the upper right is, is one of uh, the Bell states, one of the, the maximally entangled states. Um, and it has the, the features that I've, I've bulleted here. When we measure uh, just object A, we find it to be in, in either of the qubit states with equal probability. When we measure B, we find it also uh, independently to be in, in, uh, in, if we measure it independently, we'll find that it's in uh, state zero or one with equal probability. But there's this perfect anti-correlation that uh, whenever object A was found to be in state zero, B, uh, was in the opposite state, state one in, in this case, and, and vice versa. And uh, so the question I'll pose to the audience is, is this kind of already surprising, these, these three bullets, this combination of, of, uh, of kind of complete uncertainty in the individual states, but perfect correlation between the states? And, and I think generally this is where I see descriptions of entanglement stop, but I think it's quite an insufficient and unsatisfying end um, without you know, presupposing that um, folks have a deeper understanding of the existence of non-compatible measurements and the relationships between uh, measurements in, in, in non-compatible bases. This description of the randomness and correlation to me looks fairly trivial. Um, you know, for example, to pick a silly example, we could say that objects A and B are, are shoes picked randomly from a shoe box. And zero and one refers to the leftness or rightness of the shoe. And uh, you know, notwithstanding the fact that I did once purchase a pair of climbing shoes for my brother from a used uh, sporting goods store without serious inspection and, and found that uh, when I got to the cliffside that both of the shoes were left feet, uh, notwithstanding kind of, uh, uh, strange examples like this, we, we shouldn't be surprised to look in our shoe boxes and find that 
you know, exactly one left shoe and one right shoe is in there, despite the fact that the first shoe selected is, is randomly distributed between left and right. So of course, this is a, you know, a bit of a silly example. Uh, and for those initiated in quantum mechanics, the, the non-correspondence with the state vector um, that's on the, on the slide is, is obvious, but um, to the, for, for the, the non-quantum initiates in the audience, I thought it would be fun to look at a, a thought experiment that gets a little bit closer to the heart of the weirdness of entanglement. And um, hopefully it will be entertaining for the, for the quantum sophisticates in the audience as well. So for this, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll walk us through uh, this thought experiment um, due to uh, uh, Paul Quiet and, and Lucien Hardy, uh, the, the mystery of the quantum cakes. So Quantum Cakes Inc. is this uh, is this quantum company, and so they they do things kind of oddly. They they bake these quantum cakes in pairs, and the pairs of cakes emerge in sealed ovens. Uh, they're being presided over by uh, the characters from I Love Lucy. I guess uh, we have uh, one of the cakes going over to Lucy on the left, and uh, the other to Ricardo on the right. And uh, Lucy and Ricardo can make two different measurements on these cakes. They can do a rise test. They can look in the middle of baking and see if the, the cake has risen early or not. And uh, alternately, they can make a taste test. They can wait until the cake is, is fully baked and, and they can uh, do a taste test to see if it, it tastes good or bad. And the, the cute thing about this setup is, is that it kind of introduces this idea of non-commuting observables. The, the cakes are souffle-like. If you open the, the oven early, then you destroy the baking process and you can't properly assess whether the taste would have been good uh, or bad if you had let it uh, you know, cook all the way to the end. Uh, and so, okay, so, so a series of cake pairs emerge and uh, gluttonously Lucy and Ricardo uh, each make um, these measurements on, on many, many uh, series of cakes, uh, cake pairs that emerge uh, and uh, Lucy, and uh, and then after kind of many measurements, they compare notes and find that the following uh, situation results. We have uh, when they make different measurements, when Lucy measures taste and Ricardo measures rise, or vice versa, Lucy measures rise and Ricardo taste that whenever Lucy's cake rose early, Ricardo's always tasted good. And whenever Ricardo's cake rose early, Lucy's always tasted good. So there's this kind of perfect correlation between the, uh, between the cake's uh, rising state and, and the other cake's uh, taste state. Then when both check rise, they see that 9% of the time that uh, both cakes uh, rose early and the rest of the time something else happened. Either, either one of them rose early or neither did. Okay, so based on these um, results, um, I'd like the audience to, to put some skin in the game and, uh, and guess what will happen when they both check taste. Is it, is it possible to kind of logically discern uh, a bound on how often both cakes must taste good based on pieces of information one, two, and three? Okay, so I'll uh, I'll suggest uh, uh, I'll suggest some logic. Taking one and two, we see that there's this very strong correlation between the cakes, and we might explain this with a model that assumes that the cakes came from the same batter. So naturally, there's this correlation that arises, and the best instances of batter lead to uh, early rising and good tasting cakes. Then, taking one, two, and three together, uh, we can surmise something about when how often both cakes must taste good. In 9% of the instances, both cakes rose early. In those instances, if Lucy had instead decided to measure taste, then according to uh, bullet two, then uh, 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 she must find uh, that cake to taste good because, well, because Ricardo had, had measured his to, to rise early. Similarly, in those same 9% of instances, if, if instead Ricardo had, had decided to measure taste, then according to one, he would necessarily enjoy a tasty cake. Uh, we can't say for sure, based on this logic, what would happen the other 91% of the time, but at least in those 9% of cases, both cakes must taste good, right? Okay, so, uh, so then both check taste and uh, drum roll, please. 
when they both check taste, they find that never, in fact, do both of the cakes taste good. Okay, so I'll, I'll give you a moment to pick yourselves up off the floor. How can this possibly be? Uh, in the 9% of uh, cases where both cakes rose early, surely if one of the cakes had not been checked for rising, then according to one and two, the cake must have tasted good. The logic is so simple as to be you know, transparent, flawless. Uh, so where did we go wrong? Well, in quantum physics, when we have entangled states and we have non-commuting observables, uh, we're not allowed to simultaneously assign values to both of those uh, non-commuting observables. We're not allowed to make the leap from the observation in three, uh, that 9% of the time that both rose early, uh, to a conclusion about what would have happened had they not been measured for rise. In fact, they were measured, and that is critical. Uh, and so in presenting the classical logic that led to the incorrect quantum conclusion, I said something like, um, early rising and good tasting cakes. That already is a, is a, is a nonsense statement in quantum mechanics. Uh, you, you can't have an early rising and good tasting cake if the, the measurement of rising and the measurement of, of taste is, is mutually incompatible. You can't have an electron with spin up along X and along Z. So it's classically weird. And uh, then just briefly, I think it's kind of instructive to walk through the, the quantum explanation for this in the, in the, the case of uh, the state that Quantum Cakes Inc. is actually preparing. So here we have uh, the states of the cakes that are going to, to Lucy uh, with a subscript L and, uh, and the ones that are going to Ricardo with a, a subscript R. And B and G stand for good and bad tasting cakes. Okay, so, so if this is the state that Quantum Cakes Inc. has chosen to, to produce uh, for, it seems, not good business reasons, uh, then both cakes will never taste good because there is no overlap with the good, good state. If we want to uh, assess the, uh, the, you know, the, the pieces of information one and two, that whenever one cake rose early, the other tasted good, then we need to switch our, our basis for one of the, one of the observers. Uh, and the basis, uh, the relationship between the bad good basis and the non-rising rising basis is, is shown here. So when we uh, plug that in for Lucy, we see that maybe as you were expecting, there's a, a convenient cancellation. And once again, we see there's no overlap with one of the states, in this case, the, the rising bad state. And so whenever one cake rose early, the only possibility is that the, the other tasted, uh, tasted good. And uh, you can see that the, the QCI state is, uh, is symmetric in L and R. And so we must see the, you know, the, the same thing when we do the, the other uh, substitution. Finally, 9% of the time, uh, both cakes rise early. Well, we need to complete the basis transformation to the uh, rising test, rising test basis. Uh, so plugging that in for Ricardo, we get this state. And we can see that the amplitude in front of the rise, both cakes rise early state is 0.3. When we uh, take the norm of that squared as we must to get the probability of measuring that state, then we see that uh, in fact, we do get 9%. And so all of this is quantumly mundane. This is uh, just, uh, just the way things work when you have uh, entangled states. Um, so, okay, so what's, what's the point of all this? At this point, it, sh it should really only be clear that quantum computers should have the capacity for weird and, and classically inaccessible behavior. And maybe this motivates the idea that, uh, that they should be able to do something useful that classical computers can't, it certainly doesn't prove it. Um, and perhaps the easiest leap to make uh, is that classical computers should find it difficult to simulate the dynamics of quantum systems because they, they display this bizarre behavior and they, they require this exponential state space in order to, to kind of uh, fully describe the, the, the dynamics. But quantum computers should find such simulation natural. And, uh, and more generally, um, by virtue of encoding the information into quantum states, we're able to prepare and interfere and, and uh, evolve uh, these entangled multi-body states. And this allows the quantum computer to access classically inaccessible information. The magic of quantum algorithms is to 
uh, use entanglement in a clever way and other quantum properties uh, to allow some kind of glimpse at that exponential size of Hilbert space to persist through the reduction to uh, to just n bits of information out that that um, that's implied by by measurement. Okay, so uh, so then how kind of in, in practice, kind of operationally, how do how do quantum computations work? Um, I'm going to focus here on the gate model um, approach um, using an arbitrary circuit that I whipped up using uh, the the very nice tools that um, IBM Quantum Lab supplies. And uh, so this this uh, circuit consists of uh, three main parts. There's preparation of an initial state in the in the computational basis, so all zeros here. Then we apply some sequence of uh, of gates uh, to the to, to the qubits in the register, and finally we measure in the computational basis. And when we do that measurement after preparing some some uh, complicated multi-body entangled state through all of these uh, uh, sequence of gates, we'll see that we get um, some measurement results out. And the measurement results look like uh, look, look like this histogram. Uh, where we have the probabilities that we find um, these these different uh, bit string outcomes. So the the obvious question at this point is, uh, well, what do these results mean? And well, this this is just some arbitrary circuit that that I I prepared. So really, these results um, mean nothing. But but how do we construct quantum circuits that actually do result in meaningful outcomes, where the the outcomes can give us um, answers and and insights? Um, that we we can't access with uh, with classical tools, and uh, this is uh, certainly an excellent topic. Uh, but it's an excellent topic that I will not cover today. Uh, instead, I'm going to now narrow the focus to just one physical implementation: uh, qubits based on cold atoms, and uh, and and entangling gates based on state dependent um, Rydberg interactions between cold atoms. My uh, light keeps turning off. Uh, okay, well, I guess maybe I'll just be in the dark here. Um, so cold atom quantum computing, encoding a qubit. Um, I'll give a very brief introduction to the cold atom approach. For, for more information, um, I encourage you to take a listen to uh, Mark Safman's previous cold quanta webinar, giving a, a, a more general overview of the uh, atomic approach to quantum computing. Um, and I'll give uh, references at the at the bottom of the screen that you can look for for more details in. So, uh, well, there's there's many atoms to choose from, and they have different strengths and weaknesses that uh, take far too long to to cover in detail here. Uh, so I'll just focus on the initial choice that Colquana is making. Uh, we're looking at uh, encoding our qubits in in cesium. Cesium has is an alkali atom, uh, and as such, it has uh, a fairly simple, um, but still sufficiently rich electronic structure um, that will enable us to do all the quantum operations um, that, the, that the computer will need. Okay, so we've chosen an atom, chose cesium. Um, and uh, so now we need to, you know, it has this whole spectrum of, of energy levels. We need to, to choose a pair in which to encode our qubit. Well, the, the obvious choice to, uh, to, to use is uh, a pair of, of levels from the ground state, the ground state manifold, uh, which is generated by the, the interaction of the unpaired valence electron spin, uh, one half spin with the nuclear spin uh, of, the, of the cesium-133 nucleus. And uh, this is a good choice because the ground state is, is incredibly stable. Uh, the T1 relaxation times are effectively infinite. And uh, within, though, so that still gives us kind of many states to, to choose from. There's this whole manifold. So within that uh, that ground state manifold, there's uh, we we need to choose a, a single pair. And the the choice that um, again leaps out at you is to choose the m equals zero uh, clock states. Um, they provide a nice option because they're minimally affected by um, environmental perturbation, in particular magnetic field fluctuations. And so this leads to, to long T2 times of uh, many milliseconds without 
um, without really trying too hard and, and well above a second has been demonstrated as the, the state of the art. The, uh, the energy splitting between the clock states uh, shown on the screen here is this nine gigahertz number is uh, listed as being with the, with the label exact. And this is actually because the, this particular pair of clock states uh, define what, uh, what we currently mean by one second. Uh, it's precisely the time that it takes uh, a, cesium, uh, uh, a cesium atom to go through that number of, of oscillations of its, of its hyperfine splitting. But in order to do uh, kind of all of the, the different um, uh, operations that the quantum computer needs to do uh, in order to satisfy all the DiVincenzo criteria, we need to access um, other atomic energy levels to do the other operations that the quantum computer needs. Um, the figure on the left shows kind of the full spectrum of cesium and, and the cartoon on the right is highlights the, the levels that we'll actually be using uh, along with the operations that they're, that they're involved in. And I'll walk through this uh, uh, operation by operation by using uh, that, uh, that arbitrary quantum circuit that I showed earlier. So for state preparation, uh, preparing all, the, all of the, uh, the atomic qubits in the zero state, we use a technique called optical pumping using global illumination of the register uh, with a laser that uh, has a particular polarization and is resonant with, um, with one of the D1 transitions at, at A94 nanometers. The next uh, operation in this circuit is, uh, happens to be uh, the same single qubit operation across all of the qubits. And so for, for this, we actually have a, a nice uh, capability in, in the cold atom uh, approach where we can apply a uniform resonant microwave field with all of the uh, with all the qubits and and uh, make them undergo arbitrary global single qubit operations. Next up, uh, we have uh, local single qubit rotations, and these can be done in uh, in a variety of ways. Um, uh, using uh, global microwaves coupled with uh, local differential start shifts um, that make the you know the, that adjust the qubit frequency in a controllable way, uh, or with uh, local Raman excitation that can drive rotations on on single qubits uh, directly with tightly focused um, uh, local Raman excitation. Uh, entangling gates, which will be the the subject of the remainder of the talk. Uh, we have um, not actually the, the operation that is, that is shown on the, uh, in the circuit, which that, that symbol corresponds to a controlled not gate. Instead, we have a controlled phase gate um, that we drive using uh, Rydberg excitation in a way that I'll discuss. Um, and the, the controlled phase uh, operation can be turned into a controlled not operation with just uh, a couple of single photon, uh, sorry, a couple of single qubit um, uh, state rotations. And uh, this will point out that the local arbitrary single qubit rotations coupled with this controlled phase gate gives us a universal gate set that we can uh, decompose any arbitrary uh, circuit um, into. And finally, we have state readout uh, where the computational state uh, is mapped onto a fluorescent state and the fluorescence is measured. Uh, the fluorescence of all of the atoms in the rays is simultaneously measured by, by taking a uh, a picture under under um, under excitation. Okay, so before getting to the cold atom CZ implementation, I think we need to do a quick primer on Rydberg atoms. To implement multi-qubit gates in any architecture, you need to have a, a state-dependent um, interaction between uh, qubits, and in the ground state where our qubit is encoded, um, even extremely nearby interaction uh, atoms really don't interact. There's, there's negligible interactions, which is actually a nice feature. Um, when they're just idling in the, in the ground state, um, they, they remain very coherent because there's, there's no interactions. And so this is where the use of Rydberg states comes in. Uh, Rydberg states are, are highly excited states. Um, they're states with very large uh, principal quantum number n. And uh, these highly excited states of the valence electron uh, have very large uh, valence electron orbits. Um, and that results in a very large dipole moment. And large dipole moments uh, give rise to, to large uh, van der Waals interactions. 
And so this uh, results in a, in a phenomenon that's referred to as Rydberg blockade. Uh, if we have um, uh, uh, two Rydberg atoms uh, adjacent to each other in the, in the absence at least of a polarizing electric field, we'll have a van der Waals interaction. And so the, the interaction will uh, decay like, like pr pretty fairly rapidly with, uh, with the separation between the atoms, um, like R to the sixth. Where, where R is, is again, that, that distance between the, the adjacent atoms. And so if the atoms are sufficiently separated, then the, the interaction will be weak. And when we try to excite uh, the, those distant atoms uh, to a Rydberg state uh, simultaneously, we, we, can, we can, uh, can succeed. We can get that double excitation. But if the atoms are sufficiently close, then the interaction energy will push uh, the doubly excited state out of resonance with, with that driving field, and, uh, and only a single excitation can be generated. So that this, this kind of property is, is this phenomenon is referred to as the Rydberg blockade. And, uh, and because there's this distance dependence, there's, we can define something called the blockade radius, where within that, uh, that radius, it's, it's um, very unlikely to, to generate multiple excitations, and, and outside of that, it's less certain. So we'll see in a moment how to, to use this effect to implement a controlled Z-gate. Uh, but first, what, what is a controlled Z-gate? Um, what, what does that actually do to the, to the states of, of the uh, input pair of qubits? Uh, well, in general, uh, gates are typically described by their action on the computational basis states. And so for the CZ, this has um, the truth table that's shown here. Uh, three of the two qubit input states are unchanged. And the final state has its phase flipped. So equivalently, you can look at this in a matrix rep representation where the action of the matrix will be on a a column vector of the computational basis states um, in this same kind of standard ordering shown in the truth table. Okay, maybe one final piece before I get to the CZ implementation uh, with, uh, with laser pulses is to zoom in on just the relevant part of the cesium electronic structure that we're going to use. So earlier, earlier I showed the, um, this a cartoon of uh, a larger fraction of the electronic structure, but um, reducing ourselves down to just the um, just the relevant levels uh, gives us the the figure on on the right. So we're using a two photon excitation to the Rydberg state that makes use of the presence of this intermediate level. Um, but provided that we maintain the two photon resonance to the Rydberg state. Um, but detune far from the intermediate state so that we're, we're far off resonance with uh, single photon excitation, we can adiabatically eliminate that intermediate state and, uh, and just kind of more or less ignore it. And so this, this brings us to the, this kind of fully simplified uh, picture where we just have an effective two photon Rabi frequency and the, the pair of qubit states and, and a single Rydberg level that we're, that we're employing uh, to generate the blockade. Okay, so finally, now we get to uh, one way of implementing an entangling gate um, using Rydberg blockade. There are uh, a, a whole slew of protocols um, for, for generating entanglement using uh, Rydberg either interactions or blockade, um, but I think this is a relatively simple one, so we'll, we'll focus on it here and then, and then we'll take a look at uh, a more generally what what in in the more general space of gate protocols, what uh, what errors can crop up? Okay, so in this protocol, uh, we have a sequence of three pulses. We have a Rydberg excitation, a pi pulse on the control, uh, then a a two pi pulse on the target atom, and finally we de-excite the control atom with a, a, a de-exciting pi pulse um, again on on the control atom. Okay, so why does this make a controlled Z-like uh, gate? Let's look at the uh, results of this on, uh, on all the different computational basis states. Okay, so for the zero, zero state, um, all of these pulses are off resonant. They're all resonant with the one computational basis state. Uh, and so 
everything's off resonant, nothing happens. Uh, the um, uh, and so we we you know put zero zero in and we get zero zero out. What happens to zero one? Okay, well now something slightly strange happens. Uh, the control atom pulses are are uh, are off resonant, and so nothing happens there. But the target atom pulse uh, is resonant, and so the target atom traverses a path through Hilbert space that takes it up through the uh, through the Rydberg state um, and back down. And to those familiar with quantum, you won't be surprised to see that uh, after such a kind of rotation through Hilbert space, a, a minus sign crops up. And this, I think, is not a terribly intuitive result. Uh, comes from the fact that uh, SU2 is a double cover of SO3, but perhaps just take it on faith or, or solve the Schrodinger equation and, and see for yourself. Um, but uh, it, it it does present an important lesson uh, for dancing in Hilbert space. If you don't want to turn into your evil twin, you should always spin an even number of times to remember that. Okay, but anyway, so we get a minus sign. Uh, and for exactly the same reasons, when we uh, put in uh, state one zero, uh, we will also get a minus sign because the control atom in this case has traversed the path uh, up and back down uh, from the Rydberg state. So we get this minus sign. But uh, the, the target atom, the pulse is off resonant, so nothing happens there, just a single minus sign. And finally, when we send in uh, state 1, 1, we get uh, this, uh, this blockade effect. Uh, for the control, we get a Rydberg excitation. Then we attempt to excite the target, but now the Rydberg blockade has pushed the, the doubly excited state out of resonance with that 2 pi pulse. So when we attempt that 2 pi pulse, nothing happens. Finally, we de-excite the control atom, and for the same reasons as in the, the previous two cases, uh, that incurs, uh, incurs a minus sign. But because of the Rydberg blockade, we don't get two minus signs there, and, and so the, the result is, is as shown here. So if you were paying close attention, you'll notice that that's not quite the, the canonical uh, controlled Z gate, um, but it is the same uh, up to, up to a, a couple of uh, local uh, qubit rotation, so we can we can easily fix that, and and in fact in the the real implementation of this with uh, multiple photons, um, there are various start shifts that end up uh, meaning that you know, there's a little bit of variation between what uh, all of these phases are, and so there's some cleanup work with with local uh, single qubit rotations that needs to be done um, generally across most of the, the, the protocols that, um, that use these uh, Rydberg interactions to generate entanglement. Okay, so that was a, you know, a pretty straightforward sequence of laser pulses. Um, you know, what, what could be simpler? Uh, what, what could possibly go wrong? Uh, it turns out several things, um, and some of them are going kind to of more or less intrinsic to the uh, gate protocol and uh, the relevant atomic physics, and some are more technical based on uh, implementation details. So first for some of the intrinsic stuff, uh, there will be a non-zero probability that we doubly excite uh, despite the the uh, the Rydberg blockade, there's you know some some probability for off resonant excitation to that doubly excited state. This can be made extremely small given uh, sufficient interaction strength. Uh, next, the Rydberg state is well, it is an, an excited state, and uh, while its lifetime is relatively long, uh, depending on the environment and the Rydberg state used. Uh, there will still be some small probability for radiative decay. And so to mitigate this, one wants to operate kind of as, as quickly as possible, wants to go to high but not too high Rydberg states, and, and uh, maybe ultimately wants to go to cryogenic operation. So these two uh, intrinsic errors push the operation, you might notice, in different directions. Blockade leakage wants us to operate more slowly so that we have a less uh, probability for off resonant excitation uh, with, with smaller Rabi frequency. Uh, and Rydberg radiative decay uh, wants us to, to operate as, as fast as possible um, in order to, to avoid spending any time in the, in the Rydberg state and, and giving time for decay. So fortunately, uh, you know, despite the fact that there is this, this, uh, this balance between these effects, 
um, that implies the maximum achievable uh, gate fidelity uh, across the kind of whole space of, of these uh, um, gate protocols. In principle, for a wide variety actually now of, of described gate protocols, uh, the, the theoretical maximum uh, fidelity that's achievable uh, due to these, uh, these noise sources is, is kind of well above uh, the four nines level. Okay, third thing, not quite intrinsic, but still you know, really uh, purely atomic physics, um, at a finite detuning from the, from the intermediate state, uh, the population in that intermediate state that we kind of adiabatically eliminated uh, before won't be exactly zero, but th there will be some population there. And uh, in recent gate demonstrations, even with kind of relatively low Rydberg powers, um, we've seen that this this uh, this effect contributes to an error budget at, at kind of less than the 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 at roughly the the minus three level, ten to minus three level. But uh, given reasonable improvements in laser power, this can, can also be uh, suppressed strongly. OK, so, so now for the contributions to the air budget that I'm terming uh, practical or technical. These, these sources are avoidable uh, given pristine control over the, the atom environment, the atom motional state, um, and uh, extremely high quality um, uh, laser sources. Uh, first up are a pair of contributions that are due to the residual atom motion. Um, so we take great care uh, to uh, reduce atom temperature to just a few millionths of a degree above absolute zero. But you know, even at this, uh, this super low uh, ultra cold temperature, um, there is still uh, a small amount of residual atom motion at the kind of few uh, centimeter per second level. And so over the course of the microsecond or so that it takes to, to, to maybe do one of these gate protocols, uh, that corresponds to a distance traveled of, of a few tenths of, of nanometers, which is small, but a non-negligible fraction of the, of the wavelength of the, uh, the effective wavelength, at least, of the uh, two-photon excitation field. And so given that the, the velocity is essentially a random variable, this, this can lead to, to dephasing. Uh, a second contribution uh, from that same positional variation uh, comes from the, the variation of the position within these, these tightly focused individual addressing um, uh, excitation beams. And both of these effects can be mitigated by going to, to colder atoms. This is what motivates uh, motivates um, some folks in the field to, uh, to uh, look at uh, sideband cooling to, uh, to, uh, to near full ground state um, occupation of the, of the traps that the atoms reside in, um, or go to one of more, more exotic atomic species like strontium, where you can do uh, narrow band cooling that, um, that approaches ground state, um, uh, a large fraction of ground state population. Okay, a third practical error source is, uh, well, we, we, for scalability, we, we really desire to uh, be able to do arbitrary individual excitations uh, within a dense grid uh, of, of atoms, in a dense 2D grid of atoms. And so this, this leads to really stringent uh, demands on the optical design in order to achieve a really tight focus um, with minimal aberration. Uh, all across the the full field of of the of the atom array. So this this implies, you know, we we need to use very tightly focused excitation beams uh, and careful optical design. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is well that we're, we're using lasers to do this excitation. So the lasers themselves have to be um, have to be quite uh, quite quiet. Uh, have to have low noise. So. Um, we see that we need to, to have kind of uh, natively quiet lasers, uh, look for cavity locking and filtering. Uh, you, can, you can somewhat mitigate the, the uh, impact of, of uh, laser noise by, by using uh, uh, modified gate protocols. Um, and, and I guess I'll just note here that the, the requirement uh, for uh, 
laser noise with uh, quantum computing applications is slightly different than uh, the traditional laser narrowing task for uh, some other atomic physics um, uh, experiments like uh, optical atomic clocks, say. Um, and this is uh, because we're looking to drive the transitions uh, fast um, instead of looking to kind of narrow down on some spectral feature as much as possible. Um, and so this, this puts a looser requirement for us on, the, on the, the narrowness of the central feature. It still needs to be narrow, but, but not quite so narrow as, as for optical atomic clock excitation, um, but a more stringent requirement on the uh, offset frequent noise at, at offset frequencies that are uh, kind of near the, the excitation Rabi frequency. And of course, on top of mitigating all of these, uh, these, these technical error sources, there's, of course, we, we need to calibrate the parameters that are involved in the gate operations. So for the protocol that I, I uh, mentioned, there's, there's these three uh, pulses, and we, need to, we would need to, to calibrate for each atom pair that we want to, uh, to, to do this operation um, on. We would need to calibrate the, the amplitudes, frequencies, and phases of, of all of those laser pulses. So there's a, there's a, a burden of, of, uh, of calibration and doing calibration well in order to, to maintain uh, uh, high quality, um, high quality gates. Okay, so this, this brings me uh, kind of to the, to, to the summary uh, and uh, the outlook um, that I see for, for, uh, for cold atom quantum computing. Uh, well, in the, in the past couple of years, we've seen uh, one, two, and even 3D arrays of, of uh, atom qubits that have been demonstrated with uh, hundreds of atoms. And, and I think we'll see Extending that to to thousands of of, of atoms, well controlled, in, in the next uh, in the next few years. The uh, one of the nice features that I kind of alluded to but didn't highlight earlier uh, is that the Rydberg interaction uh, has you know has this finite range, and uh, this range uh, that blockade radius uh, that I was talking about can have uh, have a size that's you know, maybe ten or even tens of microns. Uh, depending on the Rydberg state that's that's being used, and uh, if you're operating in a in a dense two D array, those relatively long range interactions um, can can span a a large fraction of of a of a, of that two D array, uh, giving you a, a, a long range interaction and, and relatively high connectivity. Um, the prospect for uh, demonstrating very uh, compelling gate fidelities, uh, even in these these kind of scalable architectures, is is really motivated well by some results that have come out in the, the last couple of years showing uh, you know, 99 plus percent uh, gate fidelity, albeit in uh, in a system that is uh, um, a, a a kind of Odd qubit uh, in strontium with uh, with one of the uh, one of the qubit states actually being the excited Rydberg level, but still this shows kind of the the motivates the capability of the architecture to reach these these very high gate fidelities um, given near ground state cooling and and given um, given uh, detailed optical design and and uh, and um, doing everything very well. Something that I, I, uh, I guess this, this fourth bullet point is, is a little bit of a legacy in here from uh, an earlier iteration of the talk when um, I thought I would have time to, to cover uh, one very exciting uh, possibility uh, within the, the cold atom quantum computing space, which is the, the fact that these, these long range Rydberg interactions and Rydberg blockade uh, allows for uh, more direct implementation of, of more than two qubit gate interactions. So this whole family of uh, C, K, Z, M, where you have, uh, you have uh, K control uh, atoms and M target atoms um, can be more directly implemented um, in, in, in this architecture, making use of these, these long range Rydberg interactions. And I think that's, a, that's an incredibly exciting direction. Um, and there's been some, some first proof of concept um, results on, on implementing uh, kind of low order versions of, of those gates. So that'll be something to keep an eye on. 
And uh, finally, I think that the you know the next major step for for us and for the field is is demonstrating high fidelity entangling gates uh, in a in a truly scalable universal architecture. Uh, so dense two D arrays, individual addressing um, in 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 an arbitrary way. Um, and I think that'll be a that's the that's the challenge for um, that we're that we're putting for ourselves. So with that, uh, I'll note that if you're interested in helping to solve these and uh, and other challenges in bringing scalable uh, cold atom quantum computing uh, to a broad audience, well, we we are hiring. Uh, so tell your friends and and apply at the links in the upper right. And don't hesitate to reach out to me by, by email or on LinkedIn if you have um, any questions or in particular, any questions about the, the open positions. So I, I think we have uh, a few minutes uh, left here at the end um, for, for a few questions. Um, thank you for your attention. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, great talk. Uh, we have a couple questions lined up here that we'll get to live and uh, anybody else who um, you feel free to get your questions in. If we don't get to them live or in chat, uh, we will follow up later. Um, so the first question is, uh, how do phase gradients of the microwave field uh, over the array affect single qubit fidelity? And is there a cavity or is this just an antenna? Right. Well, so there's, there's, uh, there's, uh, multiple ways that, that one could do this. Uh, in, in our implementation, uh, we just kind of carefully orient the, uh, the, uh, a microwave horn with respect to uh, kind of the adjacent uh, surfaces and uh, the atom array itself in order to, to give ourselves kind of as uniform a, a, a phase and amplitude gradient uh, as possible in this, in, uh, in an array. So, in a dense array of the kind of sizes that we're talking about, the the um, the gradients aren't steep enough uh, that they they cause a, a significant problems for the uniformity of of that operation across the array. But in principle, that that is um, that that is an effect that will come in at at, at some level. Um, can you make a uh, a measurement, a partial measurement of the circuit uh, in the array? Uh, so, for example, um, can you measure like a few of the qubits? Um... Yeah, so this is a, a, an extremely exciting prospect. Um, you know that this is one of the kind of fundamental requirements for uh, making uh, for, for for being able to do um, feedback uh, based on stabilizer measurements for quantum error correction, and uh, it is. Uh, it is possible for us to do local excitation and, and local readout, uh, but if all of the atoms are kind of in uh, in a in the are if all of the atoms are of the same type and are are in the same ground state, then it's it's uh, likely that at the kinds of spacings that we're talking about in in this uh, architecture that uh, the local excitation the the kind of four pi scattering based on that local excitation. Uh, we'll end up uh, decohering the information in, in adjacent uh, in adjacent atoms, and so that's that that looks like a challenge. Uh, we have you know, various ideas for how to uh, how to meet that challenge, um, and one of the ones that our our, our uh, chief scientist for quantum information, uh, Mark Sathman, has has published on is is this idea of uh, of using multiple atomic species, so you can read out you know, the subset that corresponds to. Uh, one atomic species while the uh, while the, the keeping the, the quantum information intact in, in the other species. Uh, so this looks like you know one one potential answer, but I, I don't think by any means it's the only one. This will be uh, an exciting challenge to to tackle in the future. Good, that's a really good question. Thank you. Uh, how could you make a million qubit quantum computer based on Rydberg interactions? Very good. So it's a little bit unclear what the what the kind of ultimate upper limit uh, for a single uh, array 
in, uh, in a single vacuum system actually is going to end up being. It looks like if you want to go to, to tens of thousands of qubits or above, you probably need to address uh, uh, loss mechanisms by uh, going to maybe a cryogenic environment. Uh, so that, that, that could be a piece of, of the answer. Um, and going to uh, kind of more sophisticated uh, uh, capabilities for how the arrays are actually populated um, initially and, and how they're maintained. Um, so we have, we have some ideas about this that we're exploring through, uh, through our, our DARPA ONUS project um, on loading uh, from a remote reservoir. Uh, that, that could be another piece of, of the answer to that question. And then ultimately, you know, there's, there's, you know, I think there's a, a very reasonable prospect of, of getting to the thousands, tens of thousands of qubits um, in, in a single vacuum system. And after that, we can make use of the, the uh, a similar uh, approach as is being uh, suggested by um, by uh, uh, IonQ, where they have photonic interconnects proposed uh, between uh, between remote uh, registers um, that are that are in in, in separate remote uh, vacuum systems, and uh, with the, the cold atom approach, uh, just as well as with the the trapped ion approach, um, that uh, looks like a feasible way of of uh, feasible if if uh, costly way of of scaling up uh, even further. Um, one quick uh, question, I think, before we end: um, If is should I think of the um, each atom as being equivalent to one qubit? Yes, uh, yes. So um, that that's that's the way that we've encoded things: is a single atom is a is a single qubit. Uh, of course, there are all of these other states, and so there's there's a kind of more exotic uh, implementations of cold atom quantum computing that one can imagine making use of the, the, the other states to, uh, to uh, expand the state space um, that, that, is, that is available to each information carrier um, going to a qubit kind of architecture instead of a qubit based um, approach. Uh, but I think that's, a, that's not really the, the original, the, the initial approach that Colquan is taking. Instead, the, maybe I just should have said yes. Yeah, the answer is yes. Um, and uh, that, that brings us to the end of our time. Um, thank you, Tom. Uh, that was great. And uh, thank you for everybody for your questions and uh, your attention. Um, we will get to any unanswered questions uh, uh, via email later. Um, the, this uh, talk will be posted on uh, YouTube. And um, thank you. <laughs>